Okay, welcome to note set number two. So I've done a little bit of extra training on uh, this Explain Everything app. Um, I also apologize for the size of these video files. Um, I used to use Camtasia Studio and it created some really nice small uh, video files. Uh, but the uh, computer that I, the tablet I used to use that on has been misbehaving, so I had to switch to this. Um, and uh, even on the smallest setting, the file sizes are pretty large, so um, I don't know what to do about that. I'm going to see if I can later switch to something that is uh, running Camtasia Studio. Uh, but until then, i got to get these up, uh, so we'll make do with large file sizes. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is continue our review here of uh, some discrete time signals and system stuff. Uh, you should be reading in uh, section 2.1 and 2.2 of the textbook. So discrete time signals, as hopefully you know from your previous studies, are just simply functions defined on the integers. And in the previous note set, we saw um, where those where that integer came from. Uh, it's just uh, it can be related back to the instant at which the sample was taken. Uh, so if you take the index integer times uh, t sub s, the sampling interval, you'll find out the time point at which that sample came from. Uh, but sometimes we get discrete time signals and we don't know for sure if they have even come from samples. We may have just created those. Um, so uh, you should not necessarily think that the discrete time signal had to have come from sampling. Uh, when presented this way, we have no idea what the sampling rate is, sampling interval, or anything like that. Uh, so we have no way of connecting it back to uh, any continuous time axis. Uh, we do use the square bracket here to indicate that it is a discrete time signal. Um, and... Um, We'll use parentheses to indicate a continuous time signal. Now, Proacus and Monolacus don't do this, um, which is unfortunate, but I continue to do this in the notes because I think it's a good way to keep things straight. Um, <clears throat> so there are um, three different ways uh, that we can um, uh, think about or describe a discrete time signal. Um, so looking in this box down here at the bottom, uh, so we can think about a functional representation. So we saw that in, in the previous set of notes where we had like, you know, sine of uh, pi over 4 times n. Um, so that gives us a functional representation. We could have a tabular re representation where we have one column for the n values and another column for the x of n values. And so you just list them side by side. Uh, and then finally we have a sequence representation. We'll see that on the next uh, slide where uh, we will use this little upward arrow here to indicate um, where the time origin is in, in that particular setting. So here is uh, uh, an illustration of using that, that sequence uh, way of representing it. So we, we have this, something that looks like this, and you can see the, uh, the little um, arrow telling us that that is the point where, um, where the um, origin is. Now let's see here. Bear with me here for a minute while I uh, try to uh, get my bearings here on how to do things. Uh, yes, I learned how to do that last time, or in the meantime. Okay, so um, on this slide, our main thing, aside from illustrating this way of, il of showing a sequence, a discrete time signal in a sequence format, uh, we want to talk about infinite duration and finite duration discrete time signals. Uh, so infinite duration, uh, in, in essence, the signal never really stops, um, uh, goes on forever, in one direction or another. So uh, typically we might think of a doubly infinite sequence. It goes on forever in this direction and it goes on forever in that direction. Uh, a singly infinite 
uh, here we so it, we show it starting at time equal to zero. It doesn't have to start at time equal to zero, um, but we show it that way. We don't show any dot 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 to the left of that, so that indicates that this thing um, was zero prior to time equal to zero, and then it goes on forever uh, in, in in the positive direction. Likewise, we can show uh, that it goes on for zero. Uh, forever in the negative direction, um, and in this case we're showing that at time equal to zero, uh, there's no dot 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 after that, so um, things are assumed to be zero after that. Um, and again, the, the start and stops of these do not have to be at uh, time equal to zero, they could be anywhere. Uh, and we indicate that it doesn't keep going by not giving a dot dot dot. Um, then we have the finite duration, which uh, starts somewhere and stops somewhere. So in this case, we're showing that it explicitly starts at time equal to zero, but it doesn't have to. And then we're showing that it stops at some other time. And in this case, we have to kind of count it off. So we've got, um, let me just uh, get rid of that. We've got uh, um, zero, one, two, three, so at n equal to three is our last non-zero element, um, and so we can say that the function is zero for all n greater than three in this case. Um, so in this case, we would say that we have a finite duration sequence of length n. Okay, we want to touch base on some fundamental or elementary discrete time signals, things that we'll be using all the time. Uh, so you've seen these things before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. We have uh, what Proakis and Monolakis call the unit sample sequence. Um, I prefer to call it um, the unit impulse or the delta function or delta sequence. Um, but basically, it's equal to zero everywhere, and that at n equal to zero, it goes to one. Now be careful, this is very different from the continuous time delta function, which is zero everywhere, and then at time equal to zero goes to infinity and has unit area. Um, in discrete time, the delta function is um, a, a lot easier to specify, and in fact is an honest-to-goodness function, whereas in the continuous time world, the, the delta function really isn't a true function because it, it goes, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funky. That's all I'll say at this point. Uh, we have some similar properties for the discrete time delta function uh, that we saw that we you would have seen earlier in your previous course for the continuous time. Uh, so basically, if uh, we have the summation property, so if we sum the delta function over all n, uh, we get the number one, and that makes sense. We're summing up all of these zeros that go on forever. Uh, we're summing up all of these zeros that go on for zero, so or forever, uh, and we're summing up one one. So we're adding zero 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 zero, and then eventually we get to one plus one plus zero 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 zero, and obviously that equals um, that equals one. Uh, okay, uh, let's see here. I got to get back to this format here and get rid of all of that. Okay. Um, so the other thing that we can see here is this thing called the sifting property. And basically that says if we take this thing here, which is just the delta function shifted to be centered at n0. So whatever n0 is, um, instead of having 0 here, this will be whatever that number is, n0. So if n0 were 5, the spike shows up at n equal to 5. Um, and then we have, x, we have that multiplied by x of n. And so obviously all these zeros are zeroing out those individual products everywhere except at n equal to n0. Where um, So x of n0 gets multiplied by 1. We add up all those terms and the only non-zero thing in there is x of n0. Uh, and so that's called the sifting property. And uh, that's a very useful, um, very useful thing to... to have available to use. Okay, so um, I guess that covers everything on that slide.
We'll go on to the next one. We've got the unit step sequence, uh, very similar to, well, I mean, you've seen this defined before in your signals and systems class. I uh, would like to point out that some books do define um, this first element as equal to a half rather than one, um, and uh, we're not going to do that, and neither do Proacus and Monolacus, since this figure is from their textbook. Uh, we also have the unit ramp sequence, which is just um, a uh, set of samples that go up uh, increment by one uh, for each subsequent value of n. Uh, and so we can write it like this. So uh, at n equal to 5, it takes on the value of 5. Uh, and for any value of n less than 0, it takes on the value of 0. Uh, we can also write that as uh, an n function turned on at time equal to zero by the unit step. So hopefully you've seen those kinds of things before and are comfortable with those. So like I said, we're doing a bunch of review here in the first few uh, videos. A uh, real exponential signal has this particular structure, a raised to the n. Uh, and this is being defined for all values of n here, um, although we often will put a, a unit step function on this to turn it on um, at, uh, at time equal to zero, um, but that's not what we're necessarily showing uh, or thinking about here. Um, and... Uh, what its behavior does depends upon uh, the particular value of A, and there's two characteristics of A that we need to worry about. Uh, whether its magnitude is bigger than 1 or less than 1, and we characterize that with this division. Uh, and then the other is whether um, A is um, greater than 0 or less than 0, and that's characterized along this division. Uh, so we see in the upper left-hand corner a case where the magnitude is less than 1 um, and, the, and A itself is, is positive, in which case we see no oscillation, but we see that it's decaying. So the magnitude will control whether it's decaying or not, and the sign controls whether the thing is oscillating or not. Uh, so positive A causes no oscillation, negative A causes oscillation, um, and A greater than 1 causes explosion, and um, A in magnitude less than 1 causes um, a decay, and I'll let you figure out what happens when A, when the magnitude of A is precisely equal to 1. Um, so a nice uh, special case there. So that's uh, uh, real exponential, so that, where A must be a real number. We also have the complex exponential signal, which if you look at this, looks an awful lot like what we just saw, but the only difference is that now we're allowing A to actually be a member of the complex numbers. Uh, and since A is a complex number, we can write it in polar form, where we are restricting R to be greater than zero. That's the strict um, uh, condition for it truly to be in polar form. And we look over here on this plot on our complex plane where the horizontal axis is the real axis and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis. We see that R describes the length of it, which is why we require it to be um, positive and, and not negative. Uh, and then we have theta um, is the angle. Now, technically, we should allow r to be equal to zero, um, in which case um, the number becomes equal to just the number zero. Um, so technically, we should, but in that case, our exponential function isn't terribly interesting. Um, so for the, exp for the use of exponential function, we typically want a to not be equal to zero. Uh, so it's the radius R that will control the decay rate, and we can think about this with respect to the unit circle. So if A lies within the unit circle, R will be less than 1, um, and uh, this will cause a decay, uh, a decaying uh, complex exponential function. If R is greater than 1, uh, then A lies outside the unit circle, 
and we will see that this function explodes. Um, and the angle theta controls the oscillation rate. So if theta is equal to zero, then we're lying somewhere over on this real axis. Um, and so A then becomes a real number, and uh, we have no oscillation. So that's one of the cases that we looked at on the previous slide when A um, was positive. Uh, when we have a theta that's not equal to zero, then we have a number that lies you know, somewhere off here, maybe even here. So that last case that I just illustrated was the case on the previous slide when A was real but negative, and we saw that that oscillated. Um, and we can you know, kind of see all of this by looking at this form. We can see that R controls the decay out in front, um, or the exploding. Uh, and then theta controls how fast these sinusoidal terms oscillate. Um, so again, these are things that you should have seen before, and we're just touching base on them again. These, were, these are things that will pop up over and over and over, of course. Um, we, we like to classify signals into different categories, um, because once we know what category signal we're interested in, or expecting, then um, it might open up certain avenues that we can consider, but might also um, turn off certain avenues or shut down certain avenues that we might consider. So being able to keep all these things straight is, uh, is pretty good, a uh, pretty good idea. So um, some categories that we will be able to uh, um, you know, use are infinite duration versus finite duration. So we've already talked about that. Um, we'll talk next about energy signals versus power signals. Uh, we also can categorize into periodic signals versus aperiodic signals. And um, you, know, you can review that in your textbook, but you should already be familiar with that uh, from signals and systems. And uh, then a symmetric uh, or even signals versus anti-symmetric or odd signals. And we'll talk about that in, in just a little bit as well. So talking about energy versus power signals, um, in, in the continuous time world, there are physical reasons for thinking about energy and power um, because the signals that we're dealing with are often physical voltage signals or current signals or something like that. In the discrete time world, since these are just numbers inside a computer, it's a little uh, strange to be thinking about them as energy or power. Um, but we just link this idea back to the, the fact that these samples may have come from uh, a continuous time signal. And, and we also would like our definitions in this realm to be consistent with our definitions for continuous time. So we define the energy of a discrete time signal using this equation here. Uh, so uh, we just um, square, and, and in this case to allow ourselves to, to deal with complex valued signals, we take the absolute value and then square it, uh, and then, then we add it all up. So um, when you just take something like that, a sample squared, even in the continuous time world, you take that and you square it, you're, you're getting something that's related to energy uh, of, of a, uh, well, you're really getting something related to power, and then you're multiplying by a, a, a differential. But in the discrete time world, we don't quite have that differential, so we, we ignore it. Um, so this is just pretty much by definition, no physical meaning per se, just trying to keep the mathematics consistent with the mathematics for the continuous time world. Uh, now, obviously, if, if the signal is not all samples equal to zero, then um, the energy must be greater than zero. Um, now, since we're adding together, potentially, for an infinite duration signal, infinitely many samples, um, this sum could start getting very large and keep getting larger and larger and larger, unless, as we add in more terms, the, you know, the subsequent uh, contribution of each term gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so um, in order for something to have finite energy, um, the, the signal samples have to decay as we move 
in each direction away from, say, n equal to zero. Um, so in order for uh, the energy to be finite, in which case we would call the particular signal an energy signal, then we need the magnitude of its samples to decay fast enough um, as n goes to positive and negative infinity. Um, so uh, if, if that happens, then if it decays fast enough, then we get an energy signal because its energy is, is finite, and, uh, um, and, and those are a certain class of signals that, uh, um, that we often find ourselves dealing with. So um, just as two simple examples of, of energy signals, obviously any finite duration signal would be an energy signal since uh, the number of terms here would be finite and they, they would obviously add up to be some non-infinite number. Uh, but the, also the decaying exponential, so for any uh, A with magnitude less than 1, decays fast enough so that um, the energy will be finite. Uh, and I think you can also convince yourself that if you were to take a sinusoid and square uh, the values, take the magnitude squared, and add them all up, um, this thing would just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Because think about it, after you've added them up over one cycle, um, you, you get some number. Then over the next cycle, you'll get that same number again. So after two, adding up over two cycles, you've got two times that first number, then three times that first number, then four times that first number, and so on. And so that energy will grow without bound. So a sinusoid is not an energy signal. Likewise, for a unit step, you just keep adding 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 as we do the energy here. Um, and we find out that we end up with, um, you know, much, much more than, uh, well, it goes to infinity is, is, is what ends up happening. Okay, so we've, we've got that taken care of. Go to the next slide here. Um, so uh, if, if something is not an energy signal, then uh, we need to characterize its power. Um, and if we kind of link back to the physical idea that power is the rate of doing work or the rate at which energy is consumed or delivered per unit time, and then we think of our unit time as one sample, so we're, we're kind of stretching the physical um, ideas here and just trying to define things in a consistent way. Um, so, oh, there's the phone in the background, so just please ignore that. I'm recording this in my the den of my house, um, and uh, uh, no one else is home to answer the phone. So we'll just ignore that phone. Maybe you don't even hear it in the background. I don't know. Um, anyway, if we look at just adding up the energy only up to time n and time negative n, uh, the length of that is going to be um, 2n, and so um, if we take the energy over that duration and divide by the duration, um, then we would get the power, and then we take the limit as we go all the way out as far as we can in both directions. And so this gives us a definition of, of power for a discrete time signal. Um, so, you know, what happens in this case when we take the limit is we get a race between um, the thing in the top. So let me get rid of this here. Oh, okay. Uh, we get a race between the thing that happens in the top, E sub n, and 2n plus 1. Uh, so uh, if E sub n... Uh, starts growing, uh, but eventually kind of levels out. Uh, the thing on the bottom obviously keeps growing, so eventually um, that that ratio will will kind of um, go to zero because e sub n levels out, but uh, the the denominator keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so if e sub n eventually levels out and hits a limit, that, that is exactly what we've defined as an energy signal. Um, so what we've just established here is that energy signals have power equal to zero.
Um, so they are not power signals, they are energy signals. Uh, if ESA Ben grows, um, but never really levels out, but doesn't grow faster than 2n plus 1, uh, then we get a finite number as this thing, um, as this limit is considered. And whatever that finite number is, we will call the power. And then we see that that signal um, is called a power signal. And since E sub n just keeps on growing, the energy is infinite, but the power is finite. Um, so it's not an energy signal, but it's a power signal. And then uh, lastly, if E sub n grows, uh, and never levels out, but grows faster than 2n plus 1 grows as capital N gets bigger, um, then the power is actually infinite, as is the energy. Um, so a signal like that is neither an energy signal nor a power signal. Um, so those signals are, are really not things that um, we encounter, or our theory generally won't allow us to, to to deal with those things in, in general, uh, a few of them we can deal with, but not, um, not that many. Uh, so typically we limit ourselves to, to energy signals and to power signals. And how we deal with each will depend upon uh, which category those are in. Okay. Um, so this table here just summarizes what I just said. Um, so I'll just you know, put it up there and let you look at it uh, on your own. Now we get into the symmetry issue. So we have the symmetric or even function versus an anti-symmetric or an odd function. So hopefully you've seen these things before. Just want to point out that I'm illustrating this with continuous time because it was a lot easier to draw than drawing all those dots and stems. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, a symmetric or even symmetric or just even function is defined this way. And what that means is you pick any n, well, for every n, this must hold. So x of 1 must be equal to x of minus 1, x of 2 must be equal to x of minus 2, and so on. So in other words, we just have to keep looking at two vertical lines that we can move farther apart or closer together, always being equal distance from the origin. And as we do that, um, those vertical lines should always cross the function at exactly the same height. Um, so, um, you know, they should have the same value here and here, um, regardless of where they are. Um, on the other hand, for anti-symmetric, uh, when we put in n and negative n, uh, we get um, equal but opposite values. Um, so now we, we go t0 to the left and we get this value. We go t0 to the right, we get this value, and they should be negatives of each other. Um, and that will hold for any, um, you know, any two vertical lines that are equally spaced from, uh, from the origin. Uh, so it's pretty easy to see what an even function looks like. It's a little harder to actually write down the definition. Um, but if you play around with it enough, you'll, you'll see. And this little box here is just telling us that um, any odd symmetric function must um, have the value of 0 at um, n equal to 0. Uh, an even function can have any, any value at all at, at the origin. So um, you might wonder why we care about that, and you know the bottom line is that uh, you know, when we do Fourier analysis, uh, we can get some really nice simplified results if we're applying Fourier analysis to an odd function or applying it to an even function. Um, so um, the bottom line is symmetry makes our job a little bit easier to apply Fourier analysis. Um, now. Uh, you might say, well, how often do we actually get a symmetric function? Well, it turns out that any function x can be written as a sum of one even function and one odd function. Um, so, um, and we can always do it this way. So you give me the function x, I can always form the even function by just adding x 
to its time flipped version um, and uh, then getting the odd function by taking x and subtracting its time flipped version uh, and in both cases multiplying by a half. Um, so you can verify that if you do that um, you, you'll always get x of n back and you can also verify that these two functions um, are appropriately and respectively even and odd. Okay, um, now, uh, you know, I've been using the ideas of time shift and time flip here uh, without really defining them, uh, and that's because you should have seen these things before. So again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so uh, if we have some signal x of n, and we're going to uh, replace n by... Um, Replace n by, oh, there we go. Uh, if we're going to replace n by n minus k, what we're doing is shifting the function, and which direction we shift will depend upon the sign of the, val of the value k. Um, and I'm just pointing out that we've defined this as n minus k, and when we talk about the sign of k, um, we're talking about the sign of k, assuming that the negative for the subtraction is already there. Um, so if k is positive, then we get something that looks like this, say x of n minus 3. In that case, k is equal to positive 3. Uh, and that will be a shift to the right or a delay. And you can see that the function gets moved to the right. Um, likewise, if k is negative, in this case we've picked k equal to negative 2. Now we're going to, uh, you know, if we put negative 2 in here, um, for k we'll get n plus 2, uh, and that's going to shift to the left, which is an advance. So hopefully uh, you do recall those before. Time reversal, pretty straightforward. We're going to take x of n and just replace n by negative n. All we do is we we'll it at the origin, uh, and then we just um, flip it. So this side gets flipped over here and, and this side gets flipped over here. Um, and so that's pretty easy to see how that is done. Okay, um, so just as an example here, um, we can combine flipping and shifting and you just have to be careful to make sure that you, um, you know, do the right thing. Uh, so when we flip, remember, we're replacing n by negative n. We're not replacing the entire argument of a function. Um, so if we want something that is uh, minus n plus 2, what we have to do is work through this very, very carefully. In this case, we should shift left by 2 to get x of n plus 2, then replace n by negative n, that's the rule, not replace the entire argument, and argument meaning the thing inside the square brackets. We're not doing that, we're replacing just n by negative n, uh, so the 2 stays um, un, unaffected, um, and so that ends up giving us uh, the right uh, result in this case. So we have that time reversal, and then we have something called time scaling. Now, in the continuous time world, time scaling uh, is very, very different, uh, and that's basically all it does is it takes the function and scrunches it together or stretches it out. Um, but because of the constraint of discrete time f must fall on the integers, um, you know, it's a little harder to define uh, this idea of time scaling. So, um, what we're really seeing here is um, what signal processing people call downsampling. Um, so what we're going to do is um, pick some number mu that must be an integer, and we're it's basically telling us to skip some number of samples. So for example, if we picked uh, mu equal to 3 here, um, what we would be doing is just skipping through, um, skipping over some of the samples of the original signal. 
So if we look back up here, uh, we're trying to create a new signal y indexed by integers n. Um, going back into x and grabbing only mu times n. So when n is equal to 0, uh, again, this is for mu equal to 3, 3, zero, three times 0 is 0. So uh, we would grab uh, the 0th value of, of x. Then we set n equal to 1, and so now we get 3 times 1, which is 3, so we're going, when n is equal to 1, it's telling us to grab the third element of x. And what it's telling us is jump over 1 and 2 elements of x, and so on, and so on, and so on. So if we think about what this looks like, what we're really doing here uh, is, let me try to get rid of this stuff. Okay, there we go. What we're really doing here is uh, we're looking at this function here. Look at all the, the, the little stem plots there. That's x. And to create y, what we're doing is we're taking uh, some of those samples, the ones that have little boxes and then um, a dashed line through them. Those are being thrown away. The ones that are left just get re-indexed so that what was 3 now becomes 1, what was 6 now becomes 2. Uh, and that's just following this rule here. Um, and so what we're doing is we're downsampling. Uh, so the, the first sample of y, the, the n equal to 1 sample of y, is the m equal to 3 sample of x. And we've thrown away, out of every 3 samples of x, we've thrown away 2. So this is called downsampling. It's also called decimation. Um, and we're, you know, that's a, a topic that you may study um, I, I don't think we're going to get into it in this course, um, but uh, if you study more advanced signal processing stuff, you'll, uh, you'll definitely see that. Um, so we, once we do that decimation or that downsampling, we can then, you know, imagine, uh, you know, reimagine the new signal on, on the same original axis so it looks like it's been kind of squished together, but um, remember, certain samples have been removed. Um, so this, this sample here is really this one. These two are no longer in there. Okay, so um, finally we get to, uh, or next we get to the issue of adding, multiplying, and amplitude scaling. Um, and I'm not even really going to talk about that much, just say it's pretty obvious um, how those things work. So, you know, read through the text and it, it will cover that. Okay, so now we're going to get into uh, the input-output descriptions of systems. And, um, you know, so basically a system maps an input signal into an output signal. And uh, we like to provide, when we can, some simple mathematical description of how the output is related to the input. Um, and so for some systems, it's very easy to write that out. And for other systems, it's very hard. Here are a few simple examples. Um, so we might have a system that just does a, a, a one sample delay or a unit delay system. So the output is just the input delayed by one. Um, we might also have a moving average filter where the nth sample of the output is the average of the n, n minus 1, and n minus 2 um, input samples. So one way to think about that is the current output is equal to the average of the current input, the most recent past input, and the two uh, most recent past uh, input. So that's one way to think about that. Uh, extending that kind of idea, we could have the output simply be the accumulation of all um, inputs up to the current time. So if we're looking at time output time n, we're going to sum up from minus infinity all up all the way up to right now. Notice that we have to use a dummy variable here. Even if we like to think about our our signals indexed by n, 
we're using n as the current time point that we're interested in. So y at 5, we are going to want to add up x of 5, x of 4, x of 3, x of 2. So we press into service this dummy variable k to allow us to go from the current n value through all the past values. So these are just various ways of writing this. And I'd also like you to uh, convince yourself um, that uh, we could write the accumulator in another fashion. Uh, hopefully you recall knowing, uh, knowing how to recursively solve a difference equation. So I would encourage you to dust that idea off and try it out. Um, start with uh, you know, some zero initial condition. And obviously, uh, you know, we won't necessarily be able to recursively think about this all the way back to k equal to minus infinity. But suppose x of k is zero up until, say, k equal to zero, or uh, say n equal to zero. Um, you could then write this uh, accumulator as a, a simple recursive equation. Um, so you should be able to think your way through. So um, the examples that we were just looking at um, are examples of what we call difference equations, and we talked about these in our signals and systems class. Um, and our standard nth order difference equation looks like this. This is an nth order difference equation because the difference between the most advanced output sample being shown and the least advanced output sample um, ends up being n. So that's how we define the order. Uh, and it's in terms of uh, the order of the difference equation is in terms of the, the output side of this. Um, a more general way to write this whole thing looks like this. This just allows us to write uh, an arbitrary number of terms without having to write them all out. So you should be able to convince yourself that this circled equation is exactly the same as this nice yellow red box. Um, now, if we take this term and we swing it over to the other side by subtracting it from both sides, we end up getting something that looks like this. And that negative sign is there um, because of the um, specific... Um, subtraction that we just did to, to move everything over to the other side. Um, and we call this the recursive form, and basically it tells us that the current output is equal to a sum of some past output values, and you can see um, that since we started i equal to 1, we're starting at n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and so on, some distance back plus a term that is a sum of the current input and past input values uh, already received back so far, you know, back to some uh, histor historical point in the, in the past. Uh, so the fact that we're including the current means, uh, or is captured by the fact that we start with i equal to zero. So we have x of n minus zero, so that's the current input at time n, then x of n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on, all the way back to n minus m. So if we are given all the input values and we're given n initial output values, so those n initial output values are necessary for us to um, be able to go in and um, have some initial values here, uh, for our first computation of this, we can now recursively compute this uh, and uh, see how that system actually works. So um, once we have a, a um, difference equation, we can very easily write out uh, a so-called block diagram. And uh, basically, we're just trying to diagrammatically show what it is that we are um, trying to build here. So... Um, later we'll see some very systematic ways to do this, um, and we, the, the blocks that we'll be dealing with will be um, an adder, which allows us to add two signals together, 
something that will allow us to multiply a signal by a constant number. We can multiply signals by each other uh, point by point. We can do a unit delay and we can do a unit advance. So those will be our, our main functions that we'll be using to, um, to define these uh, block diagrams. So just as a simple example, and again, we'll, we'll see how this can be done fairly systematically later on, but just as a simple example, here's a simple uh, difference equation, and we can see, um, you know, our, from our two output terms, we can see that this is a first-order difference equation. Uh, and we can just verify that, um, that indeed this thing does do what we th say it's doing just by... Um, you know, looking at this block diagram. So um, we've got to create this term here. So we need um, x of n. So here's x of n coming in along this path and getting multiplied by 0.5. So when we see those little arrows, those little arrowheads in the middle of a line, those are what are being used in uh, Proacus and Monolacus to represent a multiplier. Other books use other symbols, so you might find a, a circle with a number inside it um, uh, to represent a multiplier. Either way. Um, then the other thing that we get is x of n going through a z to the minus 1, um, and later we'll, when we get to the z transform, will remind you why we call z to the minus 1 a delay, but that is a unit delay box. So if you remember, delaying a signal by 1 in the time domain is equivalent to multiplying its z transform by z inverse. So that's why we label this box that way. So that's a, a unit delay. So at the output of that box, we get x of n minus 1, which then gets multiplied by 0.5, and then those two signals get added together. Um, and so what we end up getting is um, something that gives us that, that very first term uh, there. So let me get rid of that stuff. Um, and so uh, at, at this point, we have those two uh, terms, you know, uh, with constant multipliers out in front and also... Um, then add it together. Now, notice that we could factor the 0.5 out in front of the sum, uh, and that's what I'm alluding to here when I say that we could move uh, these two multipliers to just be a single multiplier after we do the sum. And from a computational point of view, that would be a more efficient way to do it. Um, we would add first, then do one single multiplication. Uh, and, and that's doable for this system only because they both get multiplied by the same number. Okay, so now we have um, now we have that going for us. Uh, let me try to clear some of this stuff off here. And uh, so at this point, we've got this term. And so what we're, what we're going to do is add that value to 0.25 times the previous output. So if this is our output, let's just say, ha ha, there's a spot, we'll call it y of n, and what we need to do is delay that by 1. So wherever that thing is, we're going to run it into, in this direction, into that box, and what comes out is y of n minus 1. So think of these delays, these unit delays, think of them as a memory, uh, as a place of storing something. And so if you think about it that way, um, we've just stored and stored away for use in just on the next sample clock uh, period, uh, the previous output. And what do we do with that previous output? Well, we multiply it by 0.25, and then that gives us that term. We add it to this term. And since that term is sitting right there, and this term is sitting right there, we add them together. And what does that give us? Y of n. So, okay, connect that right to there. And so now we have a simple block diagram. So um, we will... 
see some systematic ways of doing this uh, later on in the course. Uh, right now, given a block diagram, you should be able to verify that it does match uh, a given difference equation. And so this leads us to uh, a way to classify uh, discrete time systems. Um, we can have a static or memoryless system. All that means is the output depends only on uh, the current value. There is no need to store in any way any past values. So y of n is only dependent on x of n. Y of n only depends on X of n. I can do anything I want to X of n, but I just can't use any n minus 1, n minus 2, or anything like that. However, a dynamic system does depend upon past input samples, and so there has to be some mechanism in the system by which it stores the, system, uh, the, the, the past values. Um, and usually that is with some feedback of previous outputs, which will have included previous inputs in their definition. Um, but in this case, we're sh uh, in these three examples here, we're showing a very explicit way of, of seeing how the, the past inputs impact the, the output. So in this case, we see y of n depends on the current input sample plus the, the next most current, or one, one notch back, uh, one sample back. Uh, so that's a, a, a finite and fixed memory. So every output will depend upon uh, just the most current and one historical sample. Uh, however, this one, our history keeps growing. The amount of memory that we need keeps growing, but it's a, a, but it's a finite amount of memory. Um, so we have uh, y of n will always be um, equal to um, all the past values all the way back to x of 0, but no farther back than x of 0. Um, so it's growing because, you know, if, if we uh, look at, say, y of 2, we only need x of 2, x of 1, and x of 0, three terms. If we go out to x of 10, we're going to need x of 10 uh, all the way back to x of 0. So that's 11 terms. So um, the amount of memory keeps growing. In this one, since the sum goes all the way up to k equal to infinity, not only do we need x, you know, to get y of, say, 10, we need x of 10, x of 9, blah, 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 all the way back, all the way back to infinity. We will need infinite memory. It remembers all the way back. Now, that's not saying physically we need infinite memory, but we do need to know uh, there needs to be some mechanism that retains the information of the input all the way back to, um, to infinity in this case. So, um, that was static versus dynamic. We'll be interested in the dynamic side of things. Uh, I'm going to go over this pretty quick. Time invariant versus time uh, variant. We talked about that in signals and systems. The bottom line is a, a system is time invariant. If you put in x of t and you get out y of t, then you put in a shifted version of that same input. If the output is just a shifted version of what you originally got, then it's time invariant. And, and that's what we're showing here pictorially. But the catch is that this is not just for some signal. This has to hold true for every possible signal and every possible shift. So um, it can be pretty tricky to show this in general. But the idea is extremely simple. Linear versus nonlinear, same kind of... Uh, scenario where we put something in, see what comes out, except now we have to do it twice. We put in x1, we say, suppose y1 comes out in response. We put in x2, okay, y2 comes out. Now we ask, what happens if I put in a linear combination of x1 and x2? Well, the output for that input 
has to be the same linear combination of the previous two outputs. If that holds true for any combination of x1 and x2 and any common, you know, any choice of a1 and a2, then the system is linear. This is nothing more than saying superposition holds. Now, for a nonlinear system, we would see that we put in x1, we get y1 out. We put in x2, we get y2 out. We put in the linear combination of inputs, but the output that we get is not equal to the same linear combination of the resulting or respective outputs. That would be nonlinear system. So again, simple idea can be difficult to establish in, in the world. Causal versus non-causal, again, this is review, so uh, I'm just going to quickly go through it. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, a causal system, as long as there are no initial conditions, nothing initially stored in, in the memory of the, of the system, uh, if you put an input in and it's zero up to a certain time, you can't get anything coming out of it until you start putting non-zero input in. Um, so a non-causal system, when there are zero initial conditions stored inside the system, um, if you start seeing something happening before the um, input does something, then uh, you would say that the system is non-causal. Okay, one more slide to go. Uh, stable versus unstable. We talked a lot about that in Signals and Systems. Uh, and th there's a lot of different ways of characterizing stability. Uh, we're talking about bounded input, bounded output stable. And this has a nice little acronym that I didn't write down, but it's called BIBO. Um, BIBO stable. So uh, it, a system is bounded input, bounded output stable if and only if every, and literally every bounded input produces a bounded output. So checking that can be rather difficult. Uh, although we saw in signals and systems that by looking at a system's poles, um, we can find out uh, something, uh, we can easily establish whether the system is stable or not stable. Um, so, uh, pretty easy to write down the definition. Here's an example of a unbound, uh, of an unstable system. Uh, if we were to just put in uh, the unit step into this system, we would find that the output keeps growing without bound. Um, and so that would be an example of an unstable system. Okay, that wraps up this set of notes. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you in the next one.